So let's open in prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. Lord, it is the only foundation on which to build a life that is pleasing to you and will redound to your glory. And it is our prayer, O oh God, that you would help each one of us to walk in a way that pleases you. Lord, we pray that you would bless this time in Jesus' name. Amen. So the first line of that hymn says, How firm a foundation, you saints of the Lord, is laid for your faith in his excellent word. What more can he say than to you he has said, to you who for refuge to Jesus have fled? But even a solid rock, while it may be a good foundation, is only good if we dig down in and anchor ourselves to that foundation. If we just build a shack and throw it on top, the winds are going to blow it away. So we need to learn how to properly understand God's word and to apply it to our lives. And so we're going to be talking about hermeneutics for two or possibly three weeks. And what is hermeneutics? Hermeneutics is the science of interpretation. It's not unique to the Bible. It's used in other areas as well, but there is a unique aspect to it, as we'll see. So in other words, in our case, it's the method or the set of rules used to properly interpret scripture. And exegesis is the practice of applying those rules to a particular passage to discover the true meaning of that passage. And so that's what we want to do. We want to learn how to properly exegete the scriptures so that we can be transformed by them and live a life that is pleasing to God and which bears fruit for his kingdom. And of course, we all know Romans 12, 2, do not conform any longer to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, perfect, and pleasing will. And also, 2 Timothy 2.15, do your best to present yourself to God as one approved. And how do we present ourselves as one approved? A workman who does not need to be ashamed and who correctly handles the word of truth. And so that's the fundamental issue here. And so what we want to know is we want to know and obey the whole counsel of God. And I hope all of you know what the motto of our school is, right? Omne concilium Dei. And you know what that means, the whole counsel of God. So a wonderful motto. All right, so what is God's purpose? Well, God has prepared works for each of us to do. And he provides his word, his spirit, his pastors, teachers, parents, and others to equip us to do those good works. So we read in 2 Timothy 3.16, the familiar passage, all scripture is God-breathed and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness, so that the man of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. And we should all come to the Bible with that in mind every day when we come to our daily reading, when we come to a Bible study, when we come to church, or in any other way, when we come to the Word of God, we should come with that in mind. This is to equip me. This is to build me up. It's When I was at the university, I used to be amazed at the students, and I would talk, especially when I was vice chair, to the ones who were struggling. You know, what's your objective in this class? And what do you think the answer is 99% of the time? To get a passing grade. I said, well, no. That's, that's, that's a secondary objective. <laughs> That's not your objective. Why are you here? You're here to learn how to be an engineer so that you can go out and earn a living and do useful work. Well, when we come to the Word of God, it is not to build us up with knowledge. It is not to puff us up with knowledge. It is not to make us feel proud. It is not to make us feel good. It is for the purpose of being trained that we can go forth and do the work that God has prepared in advance for us to do, which is what it says in Ephesians 2.10, right? We are God's workmanship created in Christ Jesus for a purpose to do the works which he has prepared for us to do. And so, I have some suggested references. If you happen to already own John Murray's book, Collected Writings, in Volume 1, Chapter 1, is a good short treatment that talks about this subject. If you own James Boyce, Foundations of the Christian Faith, Chapter 8 is a fairly good short treatment. If you want to get into this in much more depth, you can purchase the book by Mickelson called Interpreting the Bible. It's quite detailed, and on occasion it's a bit tough sledding, um, but at the end of the day it's a very valuable work that uh, provides a lot of insight. If you own Beaky and Jones, A Puritan Theology, chapter 2 is good. He talks about the Christological focus and the covenantal focus of the Puritans in interpreting the scriptures. Um, R.C. Sproul's short book, Knowing Scripture, is good. It leaves out some things, like it doesn't talk at all about typology and some other things, but it's a good book. Um, D.A. Carson, Exegetical Fallacies, 
is short, but again, a little bit higher level, and some of it's quite technical, but it's got some good material in it. Causes us all to stop and think. I found myself caught in some of his fallacies. Um, Charles Hodge, if you own his systematic theology, it has a very short, not even quite two full pages that talks about this a little bit. And finally, if you own J.F. Packer's Concise Theology, it has a, a little three-page section that goes over hermeneutics a little bit, although he doesn't use that word. All right, so what are our starting assumptions? Well, the first and most important one is that we assume the Word of God, consisting of the autographs of the Old and New Testaments, to be the infallible Word of God. That has to be our starting point, or there's no point in our being here, and there's no point in what we're getting ready to do. We also assume that that Bible is sufficient, whoops, wrong button, is sufficient, necessary, authoritative, and clear, or perspicuous, if you prefer the old term, so you can use snap or you can use snack, whichever way you want to remember those, but, uh, and it's what, for what purposes is it sufficient and necessary? For salvation and for godly living. And we must also know that we have to be born again to properly understand God's Word, of course. And so those are the starting assumptions, if, and those are necessary assumptions. The Word of God is not going to bear the fruit in our lives that we would like it to bear unless we are truly God's children. And so John Murray writes, as a little bit of further motivation here, this is in that chapter I recommended, he writes, what I am going to stress is the necessity for diligent and persevering searching of the scriptures, study whereby we shall turn and turn again the pages of scripture, the study of prolonged thought and meditation by which our hearts and minds may become soaked with the truth of the Bible and by which the deepest springs of thought, feeling, and action may be stirred and directed the study by which the Word of God will grip us, bind us, hold us, pull us, drive us, raise us up from the dunghill, bring us down from our high conceits, and make us its bond servants in all of thought, life, and conduct. What a wonderful statement. He doesn't think too highly of life outside of the Word. It's a dunghill and high conceits. But I want to point out that he uses some words here we should look at for a minute diligent and persevering searching. Turn and turn again the pages of Scripture. Study, prolong thought and meditation. There are no rules for, look, for reading the Bible that are some sort of magic formula that will let you just skim it briefly every morning for 10 minutes and walk away truly edified and built up in your faith. We're talking about hard work, but it's hard work that has a huge, huge payoff and benefit, and it is enjoyable hard work. John Murray also writes, we need to stop and consider what hopeless darkness, misery, and confusion would be ours if we did not possess the Bible. You should think about that for a minute. If we didn't have the Bible, we would be without God and without hope in the world, endlessly stumbling over our own vain imaginings with respect to God, with respect to his will for us, and with respect to our own nature, origin, and destiny. And does that not describe most of what calls itself the Christian church around us in, in this country. They are stumbling over their own vain imaginings with respect to God because they've rejected the Word of God as their ultimate standard for truth, and they're ignorant of the Word of God, abysmally so in most cases. And that's true of most who call themselves Christians this day. So we don't want to be in that camp. Murray also said the Bible is the only sufficient rule of faith and life as well as the only infallible rule, reinforcing what we said earlier. And he also says, these are the two pillars of faith and life, the whole organism of Scripture, revelation, and the promise of the Spirit to guide us into all truth. And of course, you could look at Colossians 3.16, which says, let the word of Christ dwell in you richly as you teach and admonish one another with all wisdom, and as you sing psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs with gratitude in your hearts to God. But the word can't dwell in us richly if we don't know how to properly understand what the Word says. So, God does not accept as further motivation. This is now the negative side of this. I've given you the carrot. Here's the stick. Okay? God does not accept willfully negligent worship, nor does he bless half-hearted and sloppy obedience. And I'm sure you could come up with more examples, but I put up just a few. We all know about Nadab and Abihu. They offered unauthorized fire. Whether they were drunk or whatever is not completely clear, but they offered, unauthorized, offered unauthorized fire, and what happened? They died. And then we look at Uzzah, 
he reached out and touched the ark. It seemed like a noble thing to do to prevent it from falling off the cart, but it should never have been on a cart in the first place, and Uzzah should have known that. He should have searched the word of God to see how to do it. And then you look at Saul and the Amalekites, leads to one of my favorite verses in scripture. Saul thought he was obeying God, didn't he? But he kept Agag alive and he kept alive the best of the animals. And when he said he had obeyed, what did Samuel say? What then is this bleeding of sheep in my ears? <laughs> it's a wonderful statement, I love it. <laughs> You're lying, Saul. You may think even, in your, you may have deceived yourself into thinking you obeyed. And so we have to be careful. God will not bless half-hearted, sloppy, willfully negligent worship. All right, consider these scriptures as further motivation. Whatever your hand finds to do, do it with all your might. And they offer sacrifices given to me, and they eat the meat, but the Lord is not pleased with them. And finally, Amos 5, I hate, I despise your religious feasts. I cannot stand your assemblies. And notice he's not saying, I hate, I despise your football games. I hate and I despise your religious feasts. I cannot stand your assemblies. Even though you bring me burnt offerings and great offerings, they were doing this, I will not accept them. Though you bring choice fellowship offerings, I will have no regard for them. Away with the noise of your songs, I will not listen to the music of your harps. God is not a God who is pleased when we do our thing and say it's in his name. And so this is how important it is that we read the word properly. The days are coming, declares the sovereign Lord, when I will send a famine through the land, not a famine of food or a thirst for water, but a famine of hearing the words of the Lord. Men will stagger from sea to sea and wander from north to east, searching for the word of the Lord, but they will not find it. And it occurred to me, an image came to my mind as I was thinking about this, we're swimming in a sea of heretical views of Christianity. So a good metaphor is it's not really a famine of water necessarily, it's a famine of fresh water. It would be like dying of thirst while you're surrounded by salt water that you can't drink and get nourishment from. I guess you don't get nourishment from water, but anyway, sate your thirst. All right, so here's our outline. We're going to first look at the necessary attitude for studying the scriptures, then we're going to look at the first rule, let scripture interpret scripture. We're going to look at what some people, not everybody, call the second rule, which is the literal meaning. And under the literal meaning, we'll talk about a number of things. And during all of this, we'll be giving examples. But then at the end, if we have more time, there are some other examples we'll, we'll get into. So let's look at the necessary attitude. Well, I think from what I've already said, it should be obvious that we must approach the word of God with humility. We must constantly remember this is God's word. This is not man's word. This is God's word provided to us. It's a tremendous blessing and a great privilege that we have the word of God. Um, but we need to approach it with humility. We need to approach it with a sincere desire to know God's will. And we all might be tempted to very quickly say, oh yeah, I do that. But do we? There are times when all of us go to the word of God with our own mind made up, our own thoughts about what we want to do and how we want to do it, and we're looking for something in the word to sort of say, okay, that's all right. We're looking for something to confirm us, to rubber stamp our ideas. We're not looking to see what does God say. So we need to check our hearts on that. We need to be very, very careful with that, especially when we're looking in the word for some big decision or something that, you know, in our lives, we need to be very careful. As I said earlier, it requires serious effort. This is not half-hearted and sloppy. It needs to be done with regularity. You can't put in serious effort on, on Monday and then not look at the word for the next five days. Satan will come. And we must be under authority. And we don't often think about that, but it must be under authority. Yes, we believe in the right of private interpretation from the, from the Reformation. And yes, on that day, ultimately, you will stand before God on your own and have to give an account for yourself. But with that said, you need to be under authority. R.C. Sproul makes an interesting comment here. He talks about the, the, the modern evangelical world and how it really loves Bible studies. And everybody thinks, well, of course it's a good thing if people are having Bible studies, right? And he says, well... Yeah, a Bible study can be a good thing. A pooling of knowledge, he says, builds people up and edifies them. But there's also something else that can happen. You can have a pooling of ignorance, and that's a dangerous thing. And so we want to be careful, you know? That's, that's why it's good to be under authority. You don't want just anybody leading a Bible study. You don't want just any book being used.
You don't want to approach it in any way you want to do it. You want to come and know what God says. And finally, and the most important, we must pray and ask for the Holy Spirit to help us properly understand, believe, and apply. And then after we've applied it, go off and obey that application. So if you then, though you are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father in heaven give the Holy Spirit to those who ask? So we should be asking every day when we come to the word, Lord, show me in your word what you need me, this, what I need to see this day. Teach me, train me, rebuke me, correct me. And then we have two more scriptures here. Negatively, in 1 Corinthians 2.14, it says, The man without the Spirit does not accept the things that come from the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness to him, and he cannot understand them because they are spiritually discerned. So that's a negative statement, isn't it? If I'm not born again, if I don't have the Spirit of God, I can't understand God's Word properly. That doesn't mean some pagan scholar can't be a, a brilliant Bible scholar in the sense of understanding what it says and understanding the basic meanings of the words and so forth, but he won't really understand the message of the Bible, certainly not savingly, if he isn't born again. But that's a negative statement. But then we can come to John 16, 13, and this was quoted in brief by Murray in one of my quotes earlier. But when he, the spirit of truth, comes, he will guide you into all truth. He will not speak on his own. He will speak only what he hears, and he will tell you what is yet to come. Now, that's often applied as proof that the Bible, that the New Testament is inspired. And it certainly is part of the proof of that, but it doesn't really say that. You need some other scriptures as well. This says that the spirit will guide us. It doesn't necessarily say infallibly. And it doesn't just apply to the writing of the word of God. It applies to the reading and the understanding of the word. But notice that the Spirit will guide us. It doesn't say He will do it infallibly, and it doesn't say He will do it for us. He won't drag us. He will guide us. We have to do the work. All right, so we're now ready to talk about the first rule. Let Scripture interpret Scripture. So what does that mean? Well, it's called the analogy of faith or the analogy of Scripture. It's a necessary result of the fact that there is a unity to the scripture, which is in its entirety, and this is where it comes from, you have to think about this, the word of the perfect and unchangeable God who cannot lie, and therefore it cannot contradict itself. In Boyce's book that I recommended, the one chapter on this, he doesn't talk about let scripture interpret scripture or the analogy of faith or the analogy of scripture. He simply says there's two rules the unity of scripture and the non-contradiction. But they come from the same place. If God is who we say, who the Bible says he is, he is absolutely perfect. And if he is perfect, then he cannot lie. His word must be perfect. And if his word is perfect, it cannot contradict itself. It must be a unity, Old and New Testaments, every part of it. And that guides our interpretation. As we'll see, that comes up over and over and over and over again as we're looking at how do we understand the scriptures properly. And of course, this is the cry of the Reformation, sola scriptura. The Bible alone is the infallible authority and therefore is the only rule for faith and conduct. So what does the Westminster Confession of Faith say? I think it puts it well in chapter one, paragraph nine. The infallible rule of interpretation. So they're now saying this particular rule, the first rule, which as I said, really almost you could have only one rule because all the others kind of come from this. So the infallible rule of interpretation of scripture is the scripture itself. <clears throat> that sounds kind of like doublespeak, but we'll flesh out what it means. <coughs> and therefore, when there is a question about the true and full sense of any scripture, which is not manifold, being not many, all right, but one, it must be searched and known by other places that speak more clearly. So whenever there's a passage in scripture that seems a little bit unclear, I'm not quite certain what it means, or maybe it can be read different ways, or maybe there's some uncertainty about how the author is using a particular word. We'll see that in a few minutes. We look elsewhere in Scripture, because all of Scripture is a unity. It cannot contradict itself. So if we look at the entire Bible, we will not be led astray by a single verse. And I'll give you, like I said, a couple examples in a minute or two, things that are common in our day and age. All right, also the Westminster Shorter Catechism. It's good to look at that and see what it says. And question two, of course, says, what rule has God given to direct us, how we may glorify and enjoy him? And I hope everybody knows the answer, right? The word of God, which is contained in the scriptures of the Old and New Testaments, is the only rule to direct us, how we may glorify and enjoy him. 
And then question three, what do the scriptures principally teach? And again, I hope everybody knows the answer. The scriptures principally teach what, God, what duty God requires of man, or what we are to believe concerning God and what duty God requires of man, right? Okay. So, as we said, this rule is a direct consequence of God's perfect, infallible, immutable, and truthful nature. So is that what the Bible teaches us? Well, consider some scriptures. Deuteronomy 32.4, he is the rock, his works are perfect. Be perfect, therefore, as your heavenly Father is perfect. As for God, his way is perfect. The word of the Lord is flawless. The law of the Lord is perfect. God who does not lie, and it is impossible for God to lie, and I could have put more up there, but I think that's enough. It's a consistent teaching of the entire Bible that God and his word are perfect. There is no flaw in them. And the Old and New Testaments are completely consistent, independent of modern teachers wanting to pit them against each other. I've been listening to some absolutely unbelievably awful, heretical, terrible sermons by a man I won't even name right now who's a preacher of a very large church in this country who's quite popular. And why am I listening to them? Well, because I want to know what the enemy's doing. This man is very, very persuasive and a good speaker and all of these things and sounds very nice and religious and Christian in many ways. And yet what does he do? He pits the Old Testament against the New Testament. He says, well, we can't have our foundation be on the Bible because the Bible's full of all these problems and it chases people away. We need to be founded on the resurrection of Christ. Well, okay, yeah, that's true. What did Paul write about in 1 Corinthians 15? The resurrection of Christ. If it isn't true, then my faith is futile. It's useless, right? But where do I learn about the resurrection of Christ? Where do I come to know Jesus Christ? How do I have Christ exercise his lordship in my life? It's all through the word of God. And if that word has got all kinds of problems and mistakes and I have to be the one who decides which parts of it are right and which parts are wrong, I'm lost. It's, it's all subjectivism. It's all gone. Right? So that's just complete and utter nonsense. And so John Murray says, because of the unity of revelation and the unity of what we call both testaments, what is patent in the new is latent in the old. So what is clear and obvious and stated and bold, if you will, in the New Testament was already there in the Old Testament. It just wasn't as clear. It wasn't as patent. It wasn't made completely manifest. We didn't have all the details yet. Right? That's a good thing to think about. The Bible is a unity. Don't ever let yourselves buy into this new evangelical idea that the Old Testament is somehow second rate and that we're just New Testament people. Okay? No. What's patent in the new was latent in the old. So therefore, we consistently see Jesus and the apostles and others in the New Testament times, what were they doing? Comparing each new teaching with the Old Testament, right? Let me just give a few examples again. Jesus answered Satan, how? It is written, and he wasn't saying it is written in Paul. Because Paul was still not born again. Paul was still Saul, <laughs> okay? <laughs> he didn't say it was written in Paul. He said it is written, and he quoted the Old Testament, right? And in the Jerusalem Council's deliberations in Acts 15, look at James' conclusion. He said, the words of the prophets are in agreement with this, as it is written, again, speaking about the Old Testament. And look at Acts 17, 11. Now the Bereans were of more noble character than the Thessalonians, for they received the message with great eagerness and examined the scriptures every day to see if what Paul said was true. Now Paul wrote scriptures, but they were examining the scriptures. What were they examining? The Old Testament. And then just one more, Paul, in defending his teaching to King Agrippa. We read this recently. I am saying nothing beyond what the prophets and Moses said would happen. In other words, what I'm saying is true because what I'm saying is completely consistent with the Old Testament. All right? So the Old Testament is every bit as important as the New Testament. The Bible is a unity. It does not contradict itself. That's the Scripture interprets Scripture. Uh, so here's an example use of the first rule, and if you've been listening to the podcast, I apologize, I didn't come up with a different one. So, but, you know, look at Matthew 7, 1. Do not judge or you too will be judged. Now, I could ask for a show of hands, how many people here have had some pagan throw that in your face and tell you that you're not supposed to make any judgments, okay? All right, that's just completely and abysmally ignorant and stupid, basically, and, and not knowing how to understand the Word of God at all, and not really caring to understand the Word. It's grabbing one verse and throwing it up, right? Uh, 
Well, if you do that, you can go to Ecclesiastes and some other places and you can prove all kinds of things, okay? So we can correct this common misunderstanding by just looking at the rest of that passage, as it turns out. But rather than do that, we can also look at it by using this idea of scripture interpret scripture and we can look at the teaching of the rest of the Bible. And I just throw up a few verses. You can go look at 1 Corinthians 5. You all know what that talks about. Put the, man, put the wicked man out of the church. You can look at 2 Thessalonians 3, 2 Timothy 3, and other places where we're commanded to judge. So the idea that this means we aren't to judge under any circumstances is a sheer nonsense. So then you have to look at the passage and say, well, what does it mean? It's not that it's a lie, and it's not that it contradicts the rest of Scripture, but what does it mean? And of course, it means to not judge hypocritically and take care of myself first, get the plank out of my eye, then I can help you with the, with the speck in your eye, right? It doesn't mean I'm not supposed to help you, it doesn't mean I'm not supposed to judge, but I'm supposed to deal with me first, right? All right, let's look at another one. Again, this one you know about, it comes from the Reformation. So Romans 3.28, Paul wrote, we maintain that a man is justified by faith apart from observing the law. All right, then you turn in your Bible to James 2.24 and you read, you see that a person is justified by what he does and not by faith alone. <clears throat> and if you just look at those two verses, you might say, oh my, we've got a little problem here. Paul and James had a somewhat different view of this thing, didn't they? And of course the answer is no, they didn't. So according to the first rule, what do we do? Well, we must not conclude that these verses contradict each other in any way. They're both part of God's perfect, infallible revelation. Okay, so that, and by the way, that should be your starting assumption even when you're reading something that wasn't written by inspiration. You know, I've found over the years in the textbook I wrote a number of years ago, places where I say something in one place and another place that are said differently, and it's like, oh boy, I knew what I was thinking, and I knew what I was talking about in the context here, but you know, th those two things don't really quite jive with each other very well. So human authors might, of course, make a real mistake, but even if you think you see a contradiction in a purely human, uninspired author, Normal human common decency means you should try and understand, what, well, wait a minute, what's the person saying here? What's the context? Maybe they didn't mean it in exactly the same way here as they did back there. We shouldn't just assume that the person contradicted himself or herself. That's not a very fair way to read anybody, let alone the Bible. For the Bible, forget it. That's not an option. So the solution to this problem is, is actually pretty straightforward, isn't it? Paul and James are using the words faith and justified in different ways. When Paul says that a man is justified by faith apart from observing the law, he's using justified in the sense of, of forensic justification, to refer to a right legal standing before God. And he's using the word faith here to refer to true saving faith. So, a man is justified, he has a right legal standing before God by having a true saving faith which unites him to Jesus Christ, and so in Christ he is justified, right? What was James doing? Well, when he said a person is justified by what he does and not by faith alone, if you read the whole passage, it's clear he's talking, he says, you know, earlier, you say a man is justified by his faith, and I say, you know, show me your works, right? And he says a faith, uh, he says a, a faith without works is a dead faith, right? So when he's talking about this, he's using justified in the sense of referring to proof that your faith is real, and he's using faith in the sense of a faith that's claimed but is yet unproven faith. And he's saying, so a person is justified by what he does and not by faith alone. In other words, not by saying, I have faith, but he's justified because his life and his works prove that that faith is a real faith, a genuine faith. So there's no contradiction here. And we find the answer by simply looking at all of Scripture, which of course requires what? That I know all of Scripture. Now, none of us know all of Scripture, but why is it such a great blessing that we read it every year? You know, I've been doing this now for 25 years, and I'm finally getting to the place where more often than it used to be, I see connections that I had missed before, right? And so you, you, you're reading something else, and you say, wait a minute, that, that jives with what it says over here. Now I remember what it said back in this minor prophet. You've got to go figure out which minor prophet it was and go search for it. But, you know, you see the connections, and you start to get to a place where you feel like I know the Word of God, not perfectly not exhaustively, but, but I know what the Word of God says. And if somebody says something to me that's just completely unbiblical, I may not be able to immediately come up with a verse to counter that. But in my head, I'm saying to myself, that's not right. That, that's not right. That's not what the Word of God says. I may have to go do some, spend some time to figure out why. But that's where we need to be, and much more than we are now. We need to get there to where we know the Word of God. And we'll talk later about the place of systematic theology and so forth in helping us with all of this.
So now we're to the second rule, which is the literal meaning. Not everybody calls this the second rule. And I would say it kind of follows under the first because we're talking about interpreting a written work. God used human authors under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit to provide us with his word, but he did it in our, you know, not in our language. He did it in Hebrew and Aramaic and Greek, but they can be translated into our language, okay? And maybe you can go learn how to read Hebrew and Aramaic and Greek. And so he gave it to us in human language, which is an infallible instrument, but God did it, I mean, which is a fallible instrument, but God did it infallibly. That doesn't mean that we won't have any trouble understanding it, but it means that it is sufficient. We can understand it sufficiently. And so in doing that, we should read it like we would any work to try and understand what the author actually meant. That's my point. And you know, so that means we go for the literal meaning. Now, that word nowadays causes so much trouble. There was a man in our church for a short while because he was interested in a woman who was here who was also here for only a short while. And I remember having a debate with this man that I finally just cut off because he simply could not get over the fact. He said, I know what the word literal means. And the word literal means literal. So if Jesus Christ said, I am the way and the truth and the life, or if he said, I am the gate, he had to mean I'm a gate, otherwise it's not literal. So don't tell me you're taking the literal meaning of the Bible, that's just stupid. Well, no, he was being stupid. That's not what the word literal meant at the time it was used by the reformers. So if somebody starts to get into that argument with you, back away from the word literal. Say, okay, look, it's the plain meaning of the text. It's what the author intended, right? And so don't, don't be ridiculously, woodenly literalistic about this stuff. But that's all we're really talking about, is understanding what the word says, what was meant. So each verse in the Bible has only one correct meaning, although it may have many applications. Now, a little bit of semantics here. Um, I had a question on the podcast that I answered, if you've been listening. But there's you know, an issue, is it two meanings of the verse if, if you talk about a prophet saying something that had an application at the time and then an application later, or a fuller application later? I wouldn't say that's two meanings. i said say that's, that's another application of the verse. But what we're here after here is the idea that there's a single meaning. We want to get away from the idea that there's a whole bunch of hidden spiritual meanings to the scripture that I have to somehow kind of tease out of it. Because the second I start doing that, Again, it's pure subjectivism, and I'm going to tease out of it whatever I want it to say. So the correct meaning is the literal meaning. That is the plain meaning of the text when you take into account the literary genre, the figures of speech, and all of these things. Now, prior to the Reformation, the quadriga, which simply means fourfold meaning, was popular, which, wherein each verse was assumed to have a literal, a moral, sometimes called tropological, an allegorical and a spiritual, or they'd say anagogical, meaning. And let me give you a couple of examples. This is truly amazing stuff. Okay, Melchizedek, king of Salem, and Salem, brought out bread and wine. He was priest of God Most High, and he blessed Abram. That's what it says in Genesis 14. Now, according to somebody back in the Middle Ages, the literal meaning, of course, is that king of Salem refreshed Abraham and his soldiers. Abram and his soldiers. The moral meaning is that something is to be given to the poor. Well, maybe you can get that out of that verse, but I don't think so, really. I don't think Abraham was all that poor. <laughs> Allegorical meaning is that the priest does offer up Christ in the Mass. I don't see anything in that verse that has anything to do with the Roman Catholic priest in the Mass, but that's okay. And the spiritual meaning is that Christ, in like manner, being in heaven, shall be the bread of life to the faithful. You know, okay. You know, you can go off in all kinds of completely crazy directions if you start allowing yourself to, to look for all these hidden meanings in Scripture. Let me give you one other example. Genesis 1, 1 through 3, right? In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Now the earth was formless and empty. Darkness was over the surface of the deep, and the Spirit of God was hovering over the waters. And God said, let there be light, and there was light. Now, according to somebody in the Middle Ages, this uh, Savonarola, however you say his name, Literal meaning here, we talk about heaven, earth, and light, right? That's the literal elements. The moral meaning, those, those refer to the soul, the body, and the act of intelligence. In an allegorical meaning, those refer to Adam, Eve, and the light of grace. And in the spiritual meaning, they refer to angels, men, and the vision of God. Okay, you got to have a good imagination, <laughs> okay? So this is what we say single meaning. What we're, what we're really saying is getting away from this kind of stuff. We're talking about what is the plain, simple, one meaning of the verse that God intended when he had it written. And so we're going to look at the grammatical historical method. 
The Chicago Statement on Biblical Hermeneutics correctly states in its Article 15, we affirm the necessity of interpreting the Bible according to its literal or normal sense. The literal sense is the grammatical historical sense, that is the meaning which the writer expressed. Interpretation according to the literal sense will take account of all figures of speech and literary forms found in the text. Now others call this the historical literal sense, which I think I like better, better because when I tried to figure out what they meant by grammatical historical, they, you know, obviously they're referring to the rules of grammar, but that's really the literal meaning. Okay? So they're referring to the rules of grammar and syntax and so forth. So it's really talking about the literal meaning. So, like I said, others call this the historical literal sense. It's the plain meaning of the text in its historical context. So let's take a look at genre. What kind of, that has a huge role to play here, and I'm only gonna give some examples. This is not exhaustive. But to get to the plain literal meaning of a text, we must know what kind of writing it is. So the examples I'm gonna give here, we're gonna look at the fact, you know, proverbs are not laws or promises, and if you read them that way, you'll get in serious trouble. Poetry is not historical narrative. Narrative is not directly didactic, meaning it doesn't teach directly. You have to interpret it. Parables are not allegories. I hope you all know the difference between a parable and an allegory. An allegory is a story wherein typically every or almost every single element in the story directly corresponds to something. Whereas in a parable, there's usually only one or maybe two sort of main points being made and the rest of it is details that you don't want to try and allegorize. You don't want to try and tie them to something. And prophecy is not primarily to tell us about the future. That's not its primary purpose in scripture. So let's look at these. So Proverbs are not laws or promises. In Exodus 20, 14, we read, you shall not commit adultery. That's a law. That's a law. I'm to obey that at all times, in all ways, and Christ, of course, even extended it to my thoughts, right? So that's a law. But then you look in Proverbs, 425, and it says, let your eyes look straight ahead, fix your gaze directly before you. Well, okay, we all know what that means, but it's not a literal law. If it was, if you interpret this as law, it could be dangerous when you're crossing the street, right? What do we teach our children? Look both ways before you cross. We don't say keep your eyes straight ahead, just walk. You know, some people do that nowadays, right? Because their eyes aren't straight ahead, they're on their phone. So they just, <laughs> that's why pedestrian deaths are rising rapidly, right? You've got all these people staring at their phones walking out in front of cars. But that's not a law, and we don't want to interpret Proverbs that way. And then consider Proverbs 10:22: the blessings of the Lord bring wealth, bring, or the blessing of the Lord brings wealth, and He adds no trouble to it. Well, if, is that a clear, just flat-out promise? Well, if it is, was Paul blessed? Was Jesus blessed? Okay, so you can't read Proverbs, and of course, when it comes to blessings, you always have to remember that almost all of the promises in Scripture are are not unconditional promises. They are conditional promises, right? Conditioned on our obedience and proper, proper actions. But nonetheless, you get the point clearly. You can go through Proverbs and find all kinds of places where if you read these as though these are laws and promises, you're, you're gonna get yourself in serious trouble. I don't think we need to do a whole bunch more, but let's look at one more set of ver verses in Proverbs that often causes people trouble. Do not answer a fool according to his folly, or you will be like him yourself. Answer a fool according to his folly, or he will be wise in his own eyes. Now, I would say this is what, what Mickelson in his book calls an enigmatic figure of speech, this, this little couplet here. Enigmatic simply meaning it's, it's difficult to understand, and God partly does that so that we'll stop and pay attention and think about it and meditate on it a bit, right? And if you do, I think Carson said it well. He said the point is that we should consider, as Carson puts it, will my foolish response be bringing me down to the other's level, or will it be pricking the other's pretensions and warning him of his course? So there are times when we should answer a fool according to his folly, and there are times when we should not answer a fool according to his folly, and wisdom is knowing which is <laughs> when we should do which, right? <laughs> and how to do it. But anyway, so, but you know, if you read these as laws, they contradict one another, so you're in trouble. All right, consider psalm. So poetry is not historical narrative. We'll just give one example here because I don't think anybody struggles with this really, to be honest. We all understand poetry. If you look at Psalm 19, I love this psalm, right? And the first verse is, the heaven declare the glory of God, the skies proclaim the work of his hands. Day after day they pour forth speech. Night after night they display knowledge. There is no speech or language where their voice is not heard. Obviously this cannot be read as historical narrative. Right? It's, it's clearly poetic, 
figurative language. And, fig and figurative language, of course, figures of speech occur through all kinds of different genres. They're not just in poetry. We use them all the time in our daily speech. And we'll talk about that more later. Also consider that narrative is not explicitly didactic. So if you read in Exodus 32, 14, it says, then the Lord relented. Or in the King James, it's even stronger. It says the Lord repented. Okay, but he relented and did not bring on his people the disaster he had threatened. And Jeremiah 26, 19 says, did Hezekiah, king of Judah, or anyone else in Judah put him to death? Did not Hezekiah fear the Lord and seek his favor? And did not the Lord relent? And again, in the King James, it says repent. Did not the Lord relent so that he did not bring the disaster he pronounced against them? We are about to bring a terrible disaster on ourselves. So if you look at those two verses and some others similar, open theists will say that verses like this tell us that God learns and changes because he repents, he relents, okay? But these passages are not explicitly didactic. They are historical narrative, and we need to be careful in basing doctrine on passages that are not didactic because you are interpreting them. You are drawing out of them some further reference, and that's not a fair thing to do unless you're right. So you need to look at all of Scripture and see that what you're doing is consistent with Scripture. So we also read in Numbers 23, 19, God is not a man that he should lie, nor a son of man that he should change his mind. Now, this verse is in the narrative section also, but this verse, even though it's in a section of narrative, it is explicitly didactic in the way it's constructed. And we know if you go back and look at verse 16 that this message was given to Balaam by God himself. So we must interpret Exodus 32, 14 and Jeremiah 26, 19 in light of this verse. And so in reality, you, this is the first rule all over again here, right? We have to look at all of scripture. So the open theists who take verses like that and say, well, God changes. Look, it says here, God repented or God relented. So clearly God, God's not the same all the time. He had to have learned something, right? And of course we know that the common idea now is that the God of the Old Testament was sort of mean and angry and then he got nice. You know, there was that intertestamental period where he didn't say much, and it was during that period, I think, where God got really nice. So then he came back in the New Testament, right? All right, handle parables carefully, okay? Oh, we need to, we, I wasn't paying enough attention to the time. We'll have to start here next time. So let's close in prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the great blessing of your word. And we pray, O oh God, that you would help each of us to read your word with great care, and that you would speak by your word and by your Holy Spirit that we would know what it is we are to believe and how it is we are to live and that you would be glorified in and through us. And we ask your blessing in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, you're dismissed.